We thank you for the job that you've given us. And we pray, Lord, for your strength and your uh, guidance as we do your work. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So those who are part of the team, they will be involved. They will come share with you what their responsibilities are here very soon and how you can be involved in their, their role as a, as a team. Well, uh, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Titus. Uh, it is right after 2 Timothy, right before the book of Philemon, which is also right before the book of Hebrews. So if you will, turn to Titus chapter 2. And while you're turning in your Bible, uh, some of you have asked me today, what special thing am I going to do for my, my wife? Today is my beautiful bride's 26th birthday. <laughs> I, I know You don't believe me? She doesn't look a day older than 18, does she? Uh, there, some people have asked me what we're going to do special for her today. Well, I just took her eight days to the beach. I thought that was a pretty good birthday present. But, uh, we uh, had a great time. In fact, while we were there at the beach, uh, here, I, I, I've been your pastor for almost a year now. Uh, I think maybe it's next Sunday we'll celebrate the anniversary when I came to preach and give a call. Uh, the end of August is when I officially became the pastor of Chestnut Grove. And, uh, so we're, getting, we're approaching a year. And so if you have been a, an active member of the church and come most Sundays, then you will probably have already figured out that your pastor will do just about anything. <laughs> Especially if it's, it's a challenge or on a dare. If I get challenged to do something, I pretty much can't say no. Uh, they don't get any ideas right now. Uh, but... While we were there on the beach, uh, my son Landry, who's seven years old, saw this uh, slightly older boy uh, taking this piece of wood, little, like, a, like a small surfboard almost, and tossing it down onto the shore as the waves came in. And he would run and jump on that board, just kind of skim across the water until he ran out of momentum. And when Landry was just fascinated, so he, he wanted to do it. So this boy, who we never met before, happened to be from Gwinnett County and lived up in Swanee or Johns Creek area. Uh, but he took Landry kind of under his wing and began to show him how to do it. Well, lo and behold, that night, uh, Landry said, I want one of those boards. <laughs> well, I can't let my son try something that Dad hadn't done either, so Dad bought a board too. Well, it's called skimboarding. In fact, I brought, brought Landry's with me. I brought his because he's a small and carry it. Uh, they do it by size. Uh, mine mine be a lot much bigger. But this is it's called a skim board. It's real thin. We got a wood bottom and then uh, we, we uh, got one's got a little foam pad on top. And uh, what you do is as the wave comes in, you uh, toss it on the ground and then you run and jump on it. Now if you were to, to do a, a Google search, you will see some experts and they will they will toss it out into the water and, and ride it right out to the wave and then do Curl and it looks beautiful. Then you can do some other uh, uh, a YouTube search and, and watch some amateurs do it, like this young boy was doing it, riding across the, the wave as it was hitting the shore and go for you know 15, 20 feet. Well, Landry, uh, he was getting the hang of it. He would toss it down. So what you do is you kind of you toss it down and let it hit a little better than that, and then you run and you jump on it. And you just kind of glide across the water. And uh, the lantern was getting the hang of it. And being seven, coming up to here, uh, it, it takes a little to get used to. And so he would land on the board and then I'll have to fall down. At seven years old, what do you think he did? He jumped right back up, picked that board up, and ran another one. Dad, on the other hand, <laughs> who I think I've still got some coordination to me. I, I this I hope I do. I mean, I can do a clock go across the stage. Surely I can do this. I would throw my board down, run and jump on it, and I'd hit the ground. And I didn't just bounce right back up. I would leave a, cr a crater in the ground and send shockwaves to Tanzania or somewhere. Marine life was bellowing out of the ocean. Like, what was that? And after a few I said, you know what, this is a young man's game. I'm going to let Landry do this. So I got a skateboard for sale for anybody who wants one. <laughs> it's 
one of those things where uh, I, I've always said if I'm not very good at it, I don't, I don't keep on doing it. I give up. When you only spend $25 to buy a board, I'm not giving up. But I kept on trying, kept on trying. I got a little bit better at it. Maybe by next year, I, I can turn pro. We'll see. If nothing else, I can, I can be the best faller out there. Well, if you've already got your Bibles turned at Titus chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 11. And out of the respect of the reading of God's Word, I would invite you to stand with me here this morning. Here in Titus 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and unworldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Father, we pray you bless the reading here this morning publicly of your word. Amen. You may be seated. Here as we read these verses here in Titus, these very verses kind of summarize or emphasize what is being taught here. As Paul is writing to Titus, he is emphasizing God's sovereign purpose in commanding us to live righteously. And that begins first and foremost with salvation. But it continues on past salvation, even past the point of death. God's grace is sufficient, even through death and even into eternity. The first thing I want us to notice today is the grace of God is for salvation. As seen there in verse 11, read verse 11 with me once again. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The thing I want you to note here is that the grace of God up here, that means that it is in the past tense. It is a, a, an occurrence that took place. It has appeared or it has come to pass. The grace of God is not some idea. It's not some mythological thing. The grace of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus came to be our salvation. That is God's offer of grace to us. He is making the, the reference right here that Jesus lived, He died, and He rose again. That is how grace appeared to us through the person of Jesus Christ. But not only is it a past thing that, that we can go back into history, we can see not only in biblical history, but even in secular histor historical documents of the person of Jesus, His life, His death, we can have all that, and we have the, the past reference of that. But not only is it a past thing, it's something that Christ offers to you. Grace has been offered to you. Christ is the one who did the work. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to, to attend church enough. You don't have to be baptized or have your name on a roll at, at a church. All that is, are, are great things, but it's not good enough. I, I don't care how many times I try to, to get up on this board right here or, or mine that home that's similar to this board. Uh, I, I may even master it one day. I'm not trying to grow. <laughs> I, I will never be good enough. And even those that I've watched either online or in person at the beach the past week, eventually their momentum runs out of steam and they get off. This board will not keep on going forever and ever and ever. But the grace of God does last forever. It does keep on going forever and ever and ever. And it is sufficient for you. Christ is the one who did the work. And he has offered it to you. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. But who is it for? Who is the, the grace offered for? It is, as we read there, to all people. To all. It's not to the few, the chosen, the elect. 
There are those who have differing views than I do over soteriology, which is a, a fancy word for salvation. There are those who believe that Jesus Christ died only for the elect, or only for the few, those who God has predestined. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ offers salvation to all people. The Calvinists are going to say that all men here is simply saying man, or mankind, humanity. Much like when Neil Armstrong said, uh, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And that salvation here in this reference is saying that it's offered to mankind or humanity in a general term, but not to every individual. But here, as I, as I read in, in my English translation, or if I were to go and look on my shelf in my office and get out my Greek translation, it uses the word pathosin. Pathosin right here means all. Not to mankind, not to a general term, but to every single person. Christ died for all, and His grace is offered to all. Anyone can be saved. If you are sitting here today, and you have never trusted Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, that is being offered to you today. You are included in the all. Those who come on November 3rd to our Harvest Day, that will be invited to come and hear the gospel presented to them. They are included in the all. Those that you go out and see at the restaurant this afternoon at lunch, they are included in the all. Your friends, your family member, your co-workers, everybody you come in contact with, they are included in the all. And you know what? There are people around the world that you will never meet. They are included in the all. Jesus Christ died for every single person. It is our job to share Christ with every single person we can. Now, not everybody's going to hear the gospel. We as the church have gotten lazy. We as the church have refused to go and do our work. And so there are many who will not hear the gospel. But there are also those who hear the gospel and reject it. There are many who say, no thanks, that's not for me. In fact, there will be some who come on November 3rd to the Harvest Day, and they walk out, or they come in lost, and they walk out lost because they reject the gospel. There will be those that you share the gospel with, that you uh, 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 feel compelled to share the gospel with. In fact, this week, you know, I, I love my, my beautiful bride, not just because it's her birthday, but because she hears the voice of God. We took our kids to a, 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 a kind of an amusement park type place. They put putt, go karts, and a, an arcade things, and the, and the kids just had a blast, spending all my money, uh, having fun there. But uh, after we got through playing putt putt, before we went out to go and do some go kart riding, which my cart won, by the way. <laughs> Meredith came to me and she says, "I feel God telling me to go witness to that lady behind the counter." I said, "Here." And she said, yeah, I, I know God's speaking to me, and now I, I feel I need to share the gospel with that lady. And I said, I said Mary, it's kind of loud in here. There's a lot of commotion going on. She says, but God's telling me. Well, there, there's a couple things I've learned in my life. If God tells you to do something, you better do it. Another thing I've learned in my life is if my wife tells me to do something, you better do it. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, in this situation, if you feel God telling you to do this, uh, first, my first offer was, I, I could do it, and I think that was, that was the thought. She wanted to be the one to do it. And so I said, this is what I would do in this situation. And she really did. She shared how much God loves her. Now, this girl didn't really understand. It was loud. She didn't really speak good English. She didn't get saved at that moment. But I know God honored that moment. God used my wife in a moment to share the gospel with somebody who may have never heard that God loved her. And here is an opportunity. Now, I'm not going to say she rejected the gospel. It, it was loud and crazy and hectic. And she didn't really understand. I would say that was a seed that was planted. Someone's going to come along after us and water that seed. And, and since God told my wife that that girl needed to hear the gospel, I believe that God is sending more people right now in her path to share the gospel. And one day that girl's going to say, I believe it. And I'm praying for that moment. 
So I'm not going to say that she rejected me. But there are many out there who will reject me. You will share the gospel. And you will pour your heart out. And you will share, this is the most valuable thing that I have to give to you. And they'll say, no thanks. This world doesn't care about their desperation. And the very fact that they don't know Christ. And the very fact that they will spend eternity in hell. But we know it. And we better be diligent in sharing that with those around us. Even if they reject God's grace, let's go and share it. Secondly, as we look at the grace of God, not only is it for salvation, but God's grace is also sustaining. Look at verse 13. It says there, while we wait for this blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, here in this verse, he's talking about the end times. Uh, the, the rapture of the church, the resurrection of the dead, and finally the second coming of Christ, when we will all reign with Him forever. Uh, that, that is eschatology. That, that's the end time things that, that's being mentioned right here. And uh, on uh, Wednesday night, I've been teaching through a series with my Bible study on the crowns that we earn here on earth that will be given to us in heaven. And the very last one we talked about before we went on our trip was the crown for those who are waiting for His coming. This very thing right here. And so I want to share just a little bit about this. Uh, but the first thing, and if you brought your notes from last Sunday, fill in your blanks, I'm reversing two of them. I'm starting off with letter B first. That is those who are anticipating His return. Those who are excited about the very fact that Jesus could return at any moment. You are saying, I can't wait for the return of Christ. I can't wait for the, the rapture of the church to occur. I hope it happens right now. I can't wait to see what that's going to be like. That is the anticipation, the excitement, the joy of knowing that He is on His throne. He is reigning and He can come at any moment. Are you ready? Are you ready if He came right now? Are you anticipating His return? But not only is it the anticipation of it, but it is the waiting of it. This is where I flip-flop these, uh, these points. Waiting for His return. This is what we talked about in my Wednesday night class. What does it mean to be waiting for His return? Does that mean you're sitting on the couch, twirling your thumbs, tapping your foot, saying, well, it could happen today. It could happen right now. I'm just waiting. No, waiting for His return means you're busy. You've got something to do. God is speaking to you. Just like He spoke to my wife about who He wanted her to share the gospel with, He's speaking to you. He's telling you what He wants you to do. It may be to share the gospel with somebody you know. It may be to go and, and show the love of Christ to somebody. It might be to do something that He's telling you right now. That is what it means to wait for His return. That you are listening to the voice of God and you are doing what He's telling you to do. And then thirdly, it's also praying for His return. Praying for His return. Saying, Lord, come quickly. We're in a mess down here. It's only getting worse. And it's not praying this in a selfish way. Saying, we just want out of here. We want to be done with all this. We want to be done with all the, the mess that we've made of this earth. It's, it's more than just praying it selfishly. It's praying for His glory. Because His glory will be revealed when He returns. His glory will be revealed when all the, the things we read about in Revelation and in Daniel, when all those transpire, the glory of God will be revealed. And we're praying for that very thing. Well, the grace of God is first for salvation, but it's also sustaining. Third, the grace of God is sanctifying. Look at verse 14 with me. It says there, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are, are his very own, eager to do what is good. As we look at verse 14, the first thing we see here is the redemption. You have been purchased with an extremely high price. The price of a life. But not just any life. The life of the Son of God. The Son of a King. The King who is still on His throne today. And God sent Him 
to sacrifice his life so that your sins could be forgiven. And when you trust in him as Lord and Savior, you're no longer held captive by your sins. Your ransom has been paid in full. You are now set free. And Christ's blood has satisfied your sin debt to satisfy God's justice so that you can be redeemed. You are now free in Christ. And once you are free in Christ, we then see the purification take place. You are redeemed and now you are regenerated. You're no longer the same. Christ has changed you, or at least He better have. If you're no different now than before Christ came into your life, if you don't see any change, you don't see any different, then I would question whether you got saved. You may have walked down an aisle and grabbed a picture by the hand. You may have prayed some prayer that was offered up as a sinner's prayer. You may have been dumped in a tank. You may have joined a church. You may have attended a Sunday school class. You may have done all the things you thought were necessary. But if you don't see any change in your life, if there's no purification taking place, then I question whether you truly got saved. You need to be questioning that right now. If your mind still thinks the way it did, if your tongue still talks the way it did, if you still go to the same places, do the same things that you used to do before your moment of salvation, then are you truly changed? Are you truly a child of God? It's very likely the answer is no. But you may be saying, but Brother Chris, I, I got saved when I was really young. I, I don't really see any change in my life. I, I was a child. I was pretty good. I grew up in church. I, I don't have much change. Okay. Then there needs to be evidence. There needs to be the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Do you see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Are they apparent and evident not only in your life, but so that others can see them? If you're not exhibiting those fruits of the Spirit, then that means you're not attached to the vine. The vine produces fruit. You are the branches if you're a child of God, and you are to bear His fruit. And if you're not bearing any fruit, then you need to be questioning your salvation right now. <laughs> that is how the purification takes place. When you truly get saved, and He changes you from your past to who you are now, and you begin bearing fruit, you are being purified and molded to the image of Christ. You're no longer the same. I don't care what took place in your past. I don't care how many times you've been married. I don't care how many times you've been drunk. I don't care how many times you've gone to jail. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. Because once you're in Christ, and He comes into your heart, He changes you. He makes you new and transforms you into His image. And He begins to change you. You are no better and no worse than me. And I am no better and no worse than you. In Christ's eyes, He loves us all. He died for us all. And when you accept that and invite Christ into your life, you become redeemed and purified. Amen. Next, we see here in verse 14, the, the Lordship that takes place. When you let Him redeem you, you let Him purify you, you are making Him Lord of your life. That's because... He declares us as His special people. And God's grace is now confirming that we are special. Quickly though, I want to move on. And that is when He is Lord of your life, you are making Him the servant. Or you're making yourself to be His servant. Before salvation, you were a slave. You were a slave to your own sins. Your sins held a shackle. Or a chain. It's a ball of chain. It's got you gripped. And you cannot be set free until Jesus Christ comes and sets you free. <coughs> then when He sets you free, <laughs> you choose to make Him Lord. And therefore you're choosing to be His servant. So while before you were a slave to your sin, you're now redeemed and set free as a child of God, and you choose servanthood. 
But you're now no longer a servant to yourself, to your sin. You're a servant to the Savior. You surrender all of your life to Him so that He can do His good works through you. It's not your good works. It's not what you want to do. It's what He chooses to do through you. Now remember, good works don't bring about salvation. You can be good all day long. Your good works don't earn you any grace. Grace only comes through the work of Jesus Christ. You must admit that you cannot do it. And you invite Him into your life for your salvation of sins. But then once He is your, your Lord, you will now begin to see His good works form through you. Our last thing here as we close is found in verses 12 and 15. And that is the grace of God is sharpening. How we sharpen each other and how He sharpens us. Verse 12 says, It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And in verse 15 it says, These then are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So as His Word and as His Spirit teaches us, it teaches us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God will transform you, make you who you were not before. It changes you. It takes away the power of sin had on you. And you're now living in His power. You are now a conqueror over sin. You're now able to live righteously. You couldn't before. There is nothing righteous about you. Your heart is desperately wicked. But the Holy Spirit now dwelling in you is helping you to live righteously. We are to encourage one another. As we sharpen one another, we encourage one another, not put down or destroy. I think what church members probably do best, though, is destroy. Put one another down instead of lifting one another up. I don't know why it is we want to tear one another down, tear other church members, tear uh, other members from other churches. I don't know. Maybe it makes us feel better about ourselves. I don't know. But church members are notorious for putting down others when we ought to be lifting one another up, encouraging. But then the scripture does say to rebuke. Well, there's my answer right there. I'm, I'm supposed to tear everybody down. No, that's not what rebuke means. We are to correct one another when we see someone in sin we do some doing wrong. But to rebuke means we do it out of love. Not to put them down. Not to, to chop their legs out from underneath them. We are to come and pick them up. Grab them by the hand. Stick them under our arm. And we, yes, we do rebuke. But that is a correction in love. And then we are to have fellowship. We are to love one another and not fight with one another. I, I, some Christians just would rather chastise, complain, and bicker, and give one another a hard time. I don't know why. I, I just don't. But I think Ligon Duncan, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he said people don't fall out of love. They fall out of repentance and forgiveness. Now that is true for our relationship with Christ, but it is also true for our relationship with one another. Many Christians are not willing to forgive and forget. Aren't you glad that God forgave and forgot your past? Shouldn't you be willing to forgive and forget those who hurt you? Shouldn't you be willing to forgive and forget all the things that are keeping you down? Instead of tearing one another down, we should be lifting one another up. Just as God desires to do with us. So now it's your turn. Forgive. Who's the person that you're harboring ill will towards that you need to forgive? Who's the person you need to love and encourage right now? Maybe they're here sitting beside you. Maybe they're here in this auditorium somewhere else. Maybe they're not here today. God is speaking to your heart right now. 
I'm telling you that you've been a little hard on them. It's time to start a new chapter. You begin, begin forgiving and forgetting. Yes, they may have hurt you. And your hurt feelings may be right. But now it's time for you to follow the scripture and forgive. Forgive that past sin. Forget the anger and the hurt that's there. So you can move on. And together, you can have fellowship with one another and glorify God in the process. That is what living in grace is all about. That's the power of God's grace in your life. The first that you experience that grace is the point of salvation. Is He Lord of your life? Has He forgiven you of your sins? And right now, this invitation will be for you. Today, you can invite Christ in your life. Our, our staff will be here in front. You can come and grab any one of us by the hand. We'd love to share with you how you can invite Christ in your life. Maybe you're here today and God has placed somebody in your mind that you need to forgive. You may want to come and pray at the prayer altar. You may want to come and ask one of our ministers to pray with you. You may want to go to that person right now and pray with them. However God is speaking to you, whatever the message is you see is pricking your heart about, it's time to listen. It's time to obey. Our Heavenly Father, your word has the power to change our lives. So God, as you have shared with us today, I pray that our, our lives are now being changed, being transformed. <clears throat> Father, we pray that as we have this time of invitation, we give it to you. And we ask your spirit to move and draw us to you. And that each heart will be right with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.